After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, which tribe should go first to attack the Canaanites? The Lord answered, Judah, for I have given them victory over the land. The men of Judah said to their relatives from the tribe of Simeon, Join with us to fight against the Canaanites living in the territory allotted to us. Then we will help you conquer your territory. So the men of Simeon went with Judah. When the men of Judah attacked, the Lord gave them victory over the Canaanites and Perizzites, and they killed ten thousand enemy warriors at the town of Bezek. While at Bezek they encountered King Adoni Bezek and fought against him, and the Canaanites and Perizzites were defeated. Adoni Bezek escaped, but the Israelites soon captured him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Adoni Bezek said, I once had seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off, eating scraps from under my table. Now God has paid me back for what I did to them. They took him to Jerusalem, and he died there. The men of Judah attacked Jerusalem and captured it, killing all its people and setting the city on fire. Then they went down to fight the Canaanites living in the hill country, the Negev, and the western foothills. Judah marched against the Canaanites in Hebron, formerly called Kiriath Arba, defeating the forces of Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai. From there they went to fight against the people living in the town of Debir, formerly called Kiriath Sefer. Caleb said, I will give my daughter Aksa in marriage to the one who attacks and captures Kiriath Sefer. Othniel, the son of Caleb's younger brother, Kenas, was the one who conquered it, so Aksa became Othniel's wife. When Aksa married Othniel, she urged him to ask her father for a field. As she got down off her donkey, Caleb asked her, What's the matter? She said, Let me have another gift. You have already given me land in the Negev, now please give me springs of water, too. So Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. When the tribe of Judah left Jericho, the city of Palms, the Kenite, who were descendants of Moses' father-in-law, traveled with them into the wilderness of Judah. They settled among the people there, near the town of Arad in the Negev. Then Judah joined with Simeon to fight against the Canaanites living in Zephath, and they completely destroyed the town. So the town was named Horma. In addition, Judah captured the towns of Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron, along with their surrounding territories. The Lord was with the people of Judah, and they took possession of the hill country. But they failed to drive out the people living in the plains, who had iron chariots. The town of Hebron was given to Caleb as Moses had promised. And Caleb drove out the people living there, who were descendants of the three sons of Anak. The tribe of Benjamin, however, failed to drive out the Jebusites, who were living in Jerusalem. So to this day the Jebusites live in Jerusalem among the people of Benjamin. The descendants of Joseph attacked the town of Bethel, and the Lord was with them. They sent men to scout out Bethel, formerly known as Luz. They confronted a man coming out of the town and said to him, Show us a way into the town, and we will have mercy on you. So he showed them a way in, and they killed everyone in the town except that man and his family. Later the man moved to the land of the Hittites, where he built a town. He named it Luz, which is its name to this day. The tribe of Manasseh failed to drive out the people living in Beth Shan, Tanakh, Dor, Iblim, Megiddo, and all their surrounding settlements, because the Canaanites were determined to stay in that region. When the Israelites grew stronger, they forced the Canaanites to work as slaves, but they never did drive them completely out of the land. The tribe of Ephraim failed to drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer, so the Canaanites continued to live there among them. The tribe of Zebulun failed to drive out the residents of Kitron and Nahalol, so the Canaanites continued to live among them. 
But the Canaanites were forced to work as slaves for the people of Zebulun. The tribe of Asher failed to drive out the residents of Akko, Sidon, Alab, Aksib, Helba, Aphek, and Rehob. Instead, the people of Asher moved in among the Canaanites, who controlled the land, for they failed to drive them out. Likewise, the tribe of Naphtali failed to drive out the residents of Beth Shemesh and Bethanath. Instead, they moved in among the Canaanites, who controlled the land. Nevertheless, the people of Beth Shemesh and Bethanath were forced to work as slaves for the people of Naphtali. As for the tribe of Dan, the Amorites forced them back into the hill country and would not let them come down into the plains. The Amorites were determined to stay in Mount Heres, Igelin, and Shalbim, but when the descendants of Joseph became stronger, they forced the Amorites to work as slaves. The boundary of the Amorites ran from Scorpion Pass to Sela and continued upward from there. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said to the Israelites, I brought you out of Egypt into this land that I swore to give your ancestors, and I said I would never break my covenant with you. For your part, you were not to make any covenants with the people living in this land, instead, you were to destroy their altars. But you disobeyed my command. Why did you do this? So now I declare that I will no longer drive out the people living in your land. They will be thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a constant temptation to you. When the angel of the Lord finished speaking to all the Israelites, the people wept loudly. So they called the place Bokim, which means weeping, and they offered sacrifices there to the Lord. After Joshua sent the people away, each of the tribes left to take possession of the land allotted to them. And the Israelites served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the leaders who outlived him, those who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the land he had been allocated, at timnath Sarah in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight and served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods, worshipping the gods of the people around them. And they angered the Lord. They abandoned the Lord to serve Baal and the images of Ashtoreth. This made the Lord burn with anger against Israel, so he handed them over to raiders who stole their possessions. He turned them over to their enemies all around, and they were no longer able to resist them. Every time Israel went out to battle, the Lord fought against them, causing them to be defeated, just as he had warned. And the people were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges to rescue the Israelites from their attackers. Yet Israel did not listen to the judges but prostituted themselves by worshipping other gods. How quickly they turned away from the path of their ancestors, who had walked in obedience to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge over Israel, he was with that judge and rescued the people from their enemies throughout the judge's lifetime. For the Lord took pity on his people, who were burdened by oppression and suffering. But when the judge died, the people returned to their corrupt ways, behaving worse than those who had lived before them. They went after other gods, serving and worshipping them. And they refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. 
So the Lord burned with anger against Israel. He said, Because these people have violated my covenant, which I made with their ancestors, and have ignored my commands. I will no longer drive out the nations that Joshua left unconquered when he died. I did this to test Israel, to see whether or not they would follow the ways of the Lord as their ancestors did. That is why the Lord left those nations in place. He did not quickly drive them out or allow Joshua to conquer them all. These are the nations that the Lord left in the land to test those Israelites who had not experienced the wars of Canaan. He did this to teach warfare to generations of Israelites who had no experience in battle. These are the nations, the Philistines, those living under the five Philistine rulers, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites living in the mountains of Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon to Lebo Hamath. These people were left to test the Israelites, to see whether they would obey the commands the Lord had given to their ancestors through Moses. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And they intermarried with them. Israelite sons married their daughters, and Israelite daughters were given in marriage to their sons. And the Israelites served their gods. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. They forgot about the Lord their God, and they served the images of Baal and the Asherah poles. Then the Lord burned with anger against Israel, and he turned them over to King Cushan Rishathaim of Aram Naharim. And the Israelites served Cushan Rishathaim for eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Othniel, the son of Caleb's younger brother, Kenas. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he became Israel's judge. He went to war against King Cushan Rishathaim of Aram, and the Lord gave Othniel victory over him. So there was peace in the land for forty years. Then Othniel son of Kenaz died. Once again the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord gave King Eglon of Moab control over Israel because of their evil. Eglon enlisted the Ammonites and Amalekites as allies, and then he went out and defeated Israel, taking possession of Jericho, the city of Palms. And the Israelites served Eglon of Moab for eighteen years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord again raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Ehud son of Gera, a left-handed man of the tribe of Benjamin. The Israelites sent Ehud to deliver their tribute money to King Eglon of Moab. So Ehud made a double-edged dagger that was about a foot long, and he strapped it to his right thigh, keeping it hidden under his clothing. He brought the tribute money to Eglon, who was very fat. After delivering the payment, Ehud started home with those who had helped carry the tribute. But when Ehud reached the stone idols near Gilgal, he turned back. He came to Eglon and said, I have a secret message for you. So the king commanded his servants, Be quiet, and he sent them all out of the room. Ehud walked over to Eglon, who was sitting alone in a cool upstairs room. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. As King Eglon rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, pulled out the dagger strapped to his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. The dagger went so deep that the handle disappeared beneath the king's fat. So Ehud did not pull out the dagger, and the king's bowels emptied. Then Ehud closed and locked the doors of the room and escaped down the latrine. After Ehud was gone, the king's servants returned and found the doors to the upstairs room locked. They thought he might be using the latrine in the room. So they waited. But when the king didn't come out after a long delay, 
they became concerned and got a key. And when they opened the doors, they found their master dead on the floor. While the servants were waiting, Ehud escaped, passing the stone idols on his way to Syrah. When he arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, Ehud sounded a call to arms. Then he led a band of Israelites down from the hills. Follow me, he said, for the Lord has given you victory over Moab your enemy. So they followed him. And the Israelites took control of the shallow crossings of the Jordan River across from Moab, preventing anyone from crossing. They attacked the Moabites and killed about 10,000 of their strongest and most able-bodied warriors. Not one of them escaped. So Moab was conquered by Israel that day, and there was peace in the land for eighty years. After Ehud, Shamgar son of Anath rescued Israel. He once killed six hundred Philistines with an ox goad. After Ehud's death, the Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord turned them over to King Jabin of Hazor, a Canaanite king. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Haggaiim. Sisera, who had nine hundred iron chariots, ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for twenty years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Deborah, the wife of Lapidoth, was a prophet who was judging Israel at that time. She would sit under the palm of Deborah, between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites would go to her for judgment. One day she sent for Barak son of Abinoam, who lived in Kadesh in the land of Naphtali. She said to him, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, call out ten thousand warriors from the tribes of Naphtali in Zebulun at Mount Tabor. And I will call out Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors, to the Kishon River. There I will give you victory over him. Barak told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. Very well, she replied, I will go with you. But you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. At Kadesh, Barak called together the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, and ten thousand warriors went up with him. Deborah also went with him. Now Heber the Kenite, a descendant of Moses' brother-in-law Hobab, had moved away from the other members of his tribe and pitched his tent by the oak of Zananim near Kadesh. When Sisera was told that Barak son of Abinoam had gone up to Mount Tabor, he called for all nine hundred of his iron chariots and all of his warriors, and they marched from Harasheth Haggaiim to the Kishon River. Then Deborah said to Barak, Get ready. This is the day the Lord will give you victory over Sisera, for the Lord is marching ahead of you. So Barak led his ten thousand warriors down the slopes of Mount Tabor into battle. When Barak attacked, the Lord threw Sisera and all his chariots and warriors into a panic. Sisera leaped down from his chariot and escaped on foot. Then Barak chased the chariots and the enemy army all the way to Harasheth Haggaiim, killing all of Sisera's warriors. Not a single one was left alive. Meanwhile, Sisera ran to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because Heber's family was on friendly terms with King Jabin of Hazor. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come into my tent, sir. Come in. Don't be afraid. So he went into her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. Please give me some water, he said. I'm thirsty. So she gave him some milk from a leather bag and covered him again. Stand at the door of the tent, he told her. If anybody comes and asks you if there is anyone here, say no. But when Sisera fell asleep from exhaustion, 
JL quietly crept up to him with a hammer and tent peg in her hand. Then she drove the tent peg through his temple and into the ground, and so he died. When Barak came looking for Sisera, JL went out to meet him. She said, Come, and I will show you the man you are looking for. So he followed her into the tent and found Sisera lying there dead, with the tent peg through his temple. So on that day Israel saw God defeat Jabin, the Canaanite king. And from that time on Israel became stronger and stronger against King Jabin until they finally destroyed him. On that day Deborah and Barak son of Abinoam sang this song. Israel's leaders took charge. And the people gladly followed. Praise the Lord. Listen, you kings. Pay attention, you mighty rulers. For I will sing to the Lord. I will make music to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you set out from Seir. And marched across the fields of Edom. The earth trembled. And the cloudy skies poured down rain. The mountains quaked in the presence of the Lord. The God of Mount Sinai. In the presence of the Lord. The God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar son of Anath. And in the days of Jael. People avoided the main roads. And travelers stayed on winding pathways. There were few people left in the villages of Israel. Until Deborah arose as a mother for Israel. When Israel chose new gods. War erupted at the city gates. Yet not a shield or spear could be seen. Among 40,000 warriors in Israel. My heart is with the commanders of Israel. With those who volunteered for war. Praise the Lord. Consider this, you who ride on fine donkeys. You who sit on fancy saddle blankets. And you who walk along the road. Listen to the village musicians. Gathered at the watering holes. They recount the righteous victories of the Lord. And the victories of his villagers in Israel. Then the people of the Lord. March down to the city gates. Wake up, Deborah, wake up. Wake up, wake up, and sing a song. Arise, Barak. Lead your captives away, son of Abinoam. Down from Tabor marched the few against the nobles. The people of the Lord marched down against mighty warriors. They came down from Ephraim. A land that once belonged to the Amalekites. They followed you, Benjamin, with your troops. From Makir the commanders marched down. From Zebulun came those who carry a commander's staff. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah and Barak. They followed Barak, rushing into the valley. But in the tribe of Reuben, there was great indecision. Why did you sit at home among the sheepfolds? To hear the shepherds whistle for their flocks. Yes, in the tribe of Reuben. There was great indecision. Gilead remained east of the Jordan. And why did Dan stay home? Asher sat unmoved at the seashore. Remaining in his harbors. But Zebulun risked his life as did Naphtali, on the heights of the battlefield. The kings of Canaan came and fought, at Tanakh near Megiddo's springs. But they carried off no silver treasures. The stars fought from heaven. The stars in their orbits fought against Sisera. The Kishon River swept them away. That ancient torrent, the Kishon. March on with courage, my soul. Then the horse's hoofs hammered the ground. The galloping, galloping of Sisera's mighty steeds. Let the people of Meraz be cursed, said the angel of the Lord. Let them be utterly cursed. 
because they did not come to help the Lord. To help the Lord against the mighty warriors. Most blessed among women is Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. May she be blessed above all women who live in tents. Sisera asked for water. And she gave him milk. In a bowl fit for nobles. She brought him yogurt. Then with her left hand she reached for a tent peg. And with her right hand for the workman's hammer. She struck Sisera with the hammer, crushing his head. With a shattering blow, she pierced his temples. He sank, he fell. He lay still at her feet. And where he sank, there he died. From the window Sisera's mother looked out. Through the window she watched for his return, saying, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why don't we hear the sound of chariot wheels? Her wise women answer. And she repeats these words to herself. They must be dividing the captured plunder. With a woman or two for every man. There will be colorful robes for Sisera. And colorful, embroidered robes for me. Yes, the plunder will include. Colorful robes embroidered on both sides. Lord, may all your enemies die like Sisera. But may those who love you rise like the sun in all its power. Then there was peace in the land for forty years. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel. Camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. These enemy hordes, coming with their livestock and tents, were as thick as locusts, they arrived on droves of camels too numerous to count. And they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. When they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you now live. But you have not listened to me. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Aphra, which belonged to Josh of the clan of Abizar. Gideon son of Josh was threshing wheat at the bottom of a winepress to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say, The Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have, and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you. And you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Gideon replied, If you are truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering to you. 
He answered, I will stay here until you return. Gideon hurried home. He cooked a young goat, and with a basket of flour he baked some bread without yeast. Then, carrying the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot, he brought them out and presented them to the angel, who was under the great tree. The angel of God said to him, Place the meat and the unleavened bread on this rock, and pour the broth over it. And Gideon did as he was told. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and bread with the tip of the staff in his hand, and fire flamed up from the rock and consumed all he had brought. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he cried out, O oh, sovereign Lord, I'm doomed. I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. It is all right, the Lord replied. Do not be afraid. You will not die. And Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and named it Yahweh Shalom, which means, the Lord is peace. The altar remains in Ophrah in the land of the clan of Abizar to this day. That night the Lord said to Gideon, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old. Pull down your father's altar to Baal, and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Then build an altar to the Lord your God here on this hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully. Sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on the altar, using as fuel the wood of the Asherah pole you cut down. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord had commanded. But he did it at night because he was afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. Early the next morning, as the people of the town began to stir, someone discovered that the altar of Baal had been broken down and that the Asherah pole beside it had been cut down. In their place a new altar had been built, and on it were the remains of the bull that had been sacrificed. The people said to each other, Who did this? And after asking around and making a careful search, they learned that it was Gideon, the son of Josh. Bring out your son, the men of the town demanded of Josh. He must die for destroying the altar of Baal and for cutting down the Asherah pole. But Josh shouted to the mob that confronted him, Why are you defending Baal? Will you argue his case? Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. If Baal truly is a god, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down his altar. From then on Gideon was called Jeroboam, which means, let Baal defend himself, because he broke down Baal's altar. Soon afterward the armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east formed an alliance against Israel and crossed the Jordan, camping in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with power. He blew a ram's horn as a call to arms, and the men of the clan of Abizar came to him. He also sent messengers throughout Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, summoning their warriors, and all of them responded. Then Gideon said to God, if you are truly going to use me to rescue Israel as you promised. Prove it to me in this way. I will put a wool fleece on the threshing floor tonight. If the fleece is wet with dew in the morning but the ground is dry, then I will know that you are going to help me rescue Israel as you promised. And that is just what happened. When Gideon got up early the next morning, he squeezed the fleece and wrung out a whole bowlful of water. Then Gideon said to God, Please don't be angry with me, but let me make one more request. Let me use the fleece for one more test. This time let the fleece remain dry while the ground around it is wet with dew. So that night God did as Gideon asked. The fleece was dry in the morning, but the ground was covered with dew. So Jeroboam, that is, Gideon, and his army got up early and went as far as the spring of Herod. 
The armies of Midian were camped north of them in the valley near the hill of Mor. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. Therefore, tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid may leave this mountain and go home. So twenty-two thousand of them went home, leaving only ten thousand who were willing to fight. But the Lord told Gideon, There are still too many. Bring them down to the spring, and I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. When Gideon took his warriors down to the water, the Lord told him, Divide the men into two groups. In one group put all those who cup water in their hands and lap it up with their tongues like dogs. In the other group put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths in the stream. Only three hundred of the men drank from their hands. All the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths in the stream. The Lord told Gideon, With these three hundred men I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. So Gideon collected the provisions and ram's horns of the other warriors and sent them home. But he kept the three hundred men with him. The Midianite camp was in the valley just below Gideon. That night the Lord said, Get up. Go down into the Midianite camp, for I have given you victory over them. But if you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura. Listen to what the Midianites are saying, and you will be greatly encouraged. Then you will be eager to attack. So Gideon took Pura and went down to the edge of the enemy camp. The armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east had settled in the valley like a swarm of locusts. Their camels were like grains of sand on the seashore, too many to count. Gideon crept up just as a man was telling his companion about a dream. The man said, I had this dream, and in my dream a loaf of barley bread came tumbling down into the Midianite camp. It hit a tent, turned it over, and knocked it flat. His companion answered, Your dream can mean only one thing, God has given Gideon son of Josh, the Israelite, victory over Midian and all its allies. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship before the Lord. Then he returned to the Israelite camp and shouted, Get up! For the Lord has given you victory over the Midianite hordes. He divided the three hundred men into three groups and gave each man a ram's horn and a clay jar with a torch in it. Then he said to them, Keep your eyes on me. When I come to the edge of the camp, do just as I do. As soon as I and those with me blow the ram's horns, blow your horns, too, all around the entire camp, and shout, For the Lord and for Gideon. It was just after midnight, after the changing of the guard, when Gideon and the one hundred men with him reached the edge of the Midianite camp. Suddenly, they blew the ram's horns and broke their clay jars. Then all three groups blew their horns and broke their jars. They held the blazing torches in their left hands and the horns in their right hands, and they all shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Each man stood at his position around the camp and watched as all the Midianites rushed around in a panic, shouting as they ran to escape. When the three hundred Israelites blew their ram's horns, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. Those who were not killed fled to places as far away as Beth Shitta near Zerira and to the border of Abel Mehola near Tabbath. Then Gideon sent for the warriors of Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh, who joined in chasing the army of Midian. Gideon also sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down to attack the Midianites. Cut them off at the shallow crossings of the Jordan River at Bethbara. 
So all the men of Ephraim did as they were told. They captured Oreb and Zeb, the two Midianite commanders, killing Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb at the winepress of Zeb. And they continued to chase the Midianites. Afterward the Israelites brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, who was by the Jordan River. Then the people of Ephraim asked Gideon, Why have you treated us this way? Why didn't you send for us when you first went out to fight the Midianites? And they argued heatedly with Gideon. But Gideon replied, What have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't even the leftover grapes of Ephraim's harvest better than the entire crop of my little clan of Abizer? God gave you victory over Oreb and Zeb, the commanders of the Midianite army. What have I accomplished compared to that? When the men of Ephraim heard Gideon's answer, their anger subsided. Gideon then crossed the Jordan River with his three hundred men, and though exhausted, they continued to chase the enemy. When they reached Sukkis, Gideon asked the leaders of the town, Please give my warriors some food. They are very tired. I am chasing Zeba and Zalmana, the kings of Midian. But the officials of Sukkis replied, Catch Zeba and Zalmana first, and then we will feed your army. So Gideon said, After the Lord gives me victory over Zeba and Zalmana, I will return and tear your flesh with the thorns and briars from the wilderness. From there Gideon went up to Peniel and again asked for food, but he got the same answer. So he said to the people of Peniel, After I return in victory, I will tear down this tower. By this time Zeba and Zalmana were in Karkar with about 15,000 warriors, all that remained of the allied armies of the east, for 120,000 had already been killed. Gideon circled around by the caravan route east of Noba and Jogbiha, taking the Midianite army by surprise. Zeba and Zalmana, the two Midianite kings, fled, but Gideon chased them down and captured all their warriors. After this, Gideon returned from the battle by way of Heres Pass. There he captured a young man from Sukkis and demanded that he write down the names of all the seventy-seven officials and elders in the town. Gideon then returned to Sukkis and said to the leaders, Here are Zeba and Zalmana. When we were here before, you taunted me, saying, Catch Zeba and Zalmana first, and then we will feed your exhausted army. Then Gideon took the elders of the town and taught them a lesson, punishing them with thorns and briars from the wilderness. He also tore down the tower of Peniel and killed all the men in the town. Then Gideon asked Zeba and Zalmana, the men you killed at Tabor, what were they like? Like you, they replied. They all had the look of a king's son. They were my brothers, the sons of my own mother. Gideon exclaimed. As surely as the Lord lives, I wouldn't kill you if you hadn't killed them. Turning to Jether, his oldest son, he said, Kill them. But Jether did not draw his sword, for he was only a boy and was afraid. Then Zeba and Zalmana said to Gideon, Be a man. Kill us yourself. So Gideon killed them both and took the royal ornaments from the necks of their camels. Then the Israelites said to Gideon, Be our ruler. You and your son and your grandson will be our rulers, for you have rescued us from Midian. But Gideon replied, I will not rule over you, nor will my son. The Lord will rule over you. However, I do have one request that each of you give me an earring from the plunder you collected from your fallen enemies. The enemies, being Ishmaelites, all wore gold earrings. Gladly, they replied. They spread out a cloak, and each one threw in a gold earring he had gathered from the plunder. The weight of the gold earrings was forty-three pounds, not including the royal ornaments and pendants, the purple clothing worn by the kings of Midian, or the chains around the necks of their camels. Gideon made a sacred ephod from the gold and put it in Aphra, 
his hometown. But soon all the Israelites prostituted themselves by worshipping it, and it became a trap for Gideon and his family. That is the story of how the people of Israel defeated Midian, which never recovered. Throughout the rest of Gideon's lifetime, about forty years, there was peace in the land. Then Gideon son of Josh returned home. He had seventy sons born to him, for he had many wives. He also had a concubine in Shechem, who gave birth to a son, whom he named Abimelech. Gideon died when he was very old, and he was buried in the grave of his father, Josh, at Ophrah in the land of the clan of Abizar. As soon as Gideon died, the Israelites prostituted themselves by worshipping the images of Baal, making Baalberith their god. They forgot the Lord their god, who had rescued them from all their enemies surrounding them. Nor did they show any loyalty to the family of Jeroboam, that is, Gideon, despite all the good he had done for Israel. One day Gideon's son Abimelech went to Shechem to visit his uncles, his mother's brothers. He said to them and to the rest of his mother's family, Ask the leading citizens of Shechem whether they want to be ruled by all seventy of Gideon's sons or by one man. And remember that I am your own flesh and blood. So Abimelech's uncles gave his message to all the citizens of Shechem on his behalf. And after listening to this proposal, the people of Shechem decided in favor of Abimelech because he was their relative. They gave him seventy silver coins from the temple of Balberith, which he used to hire some reckless troublemakers who agreed to follow him. He went to his father's home at Ophrah, and there, on one stone, they killed all seventy of his half-brothers, the sons of Gideon, but the youngest brother, Jotham, escaped and hid. Then all the leading citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo called a meeting under the oak beside the pillar at Shechem and made Abimelech their king. When Jotham heard about this, he climbed to the top of Mount Gerizim and shouted, Listen to me, citizens of Shechem. Listen to me if you want God to listen to you. Once upon a time the trees decided to choose a king. First they said to the olive tree, be our king. But the olive tree refused, saying, Should I quit producing the olive oil? That blesses both God and people. Just to wave back and forth over the trees. Then they said to the fig tree, You be our king. But the fig tree also refused, saying, Should I quit producing my sweet fruit? just to wave back and forth over the trees. Then they said to the grapevine, You be our king. But the grapevine also refused, saying, Should I quit producing the wine? That cheers both God and people, just to wave back and forth over the trees. Then all the trees finally turned to the thorn bush and said, Come, you be our king. And the thorn bush replied to the trees, If you truly want to make me your king, come and take shelter in my shade. If not, let fire come out from me, and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Jotham continued, Now make sure you have acted honorably and in good faith by making Abimelech your king, and that you have done right by Gideon and all of his descendants. Have you treated him with the honor he deserves for all he accomplished? For he fought for you and risked his life when he rescued you from the Midianites. But today you have revolted against my father and his descendants, killing his seventy sons on one stone. And you have chosen his slave woman's son, Abimelech, to be your king just because he is your relative. If you have acted honorably and in good faith toward Gideon and his descendants today, then may you find joy in Abimelech, and may he find joy in you. But if you have not acted in good faith, then may fire come out from Abimelech and devour the leading citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, 
and may fire come out from the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. Then Jotham escaped and lived in Beer because he was afraid of his brother Abimelech. After Abimelech had ruled over Israel for three years, God sent a spirit that stirred up trouble between Abimelech and the leading citizens of Shechem, and they revolted. God was punishing Abimelech for murdering Gideon's seventy sons, and the citizens of Shechem for supporting him in this treachery of murdering his brothers. The citizens of Shechem set an ambush for Abimelech on the hilltops and robbed everyone who passed that way. But someone warned Abimelech about their plot. One day Gaul son of Ebed moved to Shechem with his brothers and gained the confidence of the leading citizens of Shechem. During the annual harvest festival at Shechem, held in the temple of the local god, the wine flowed freely, and everyone began cursing Abimelech. Who is Abimelech? Gaul shouted. He's not a true son of Shechem, so why should we be his servants? He's merely the son of Gideon, and this Zebel is merely his deputy. Serve the true sons of Hammer, the founder of Shechem. Why should we serve Abimelech? If I were in charge here, I would get rid of Abimelech. I would say to him, get some soldiers, and come out and fight. But when Zebel, the leader of the city, heard what Gaul was saying, he was furious. He sent messengers to Abimelech in Aroma, telling him, Gaul's son of Ebed and his brothers have come to live in Shechem, and now they are inciting the city to rebel against you. Come by night with an army and hide out in the fields. In the morning, as soon as it is daylight, attack the city. When Gaul and those who are with him come out against you, you can do with them as you wish. So Abimelech and all his men went by night and split into four groups, stationing themselves around Shechem. Gaul was standing at the city gates when Abimelech and his army came out of hiding. When Gaul saw them, he said to Zebel, Look, there are people coming down from the hilltops. Zebel replied, It's just the shadows on the hills that look like men. But again Gaul said, No, people are coming down from the hills. And another group is coming down the road past the diviner's oak. Then Zebel turned on him and asked, Now where is that big mouth of yours? Wasn't it you that said, Who is Abimelech, and why should we be his servants? The men you mocked are right outside the city. Go out and fight them. So Gaul led the leading citizens of Shechem into battle against Abimelech. But Abimelech chased him, and many of Shechem's men were wounded and fell along the road as they retreated to the city gate. Abimelech returned to Aroma, and Zebel drove Gaul and his brothers out of Shechem. The next day the people of Shechem went out into the fields to battle. When Abimelech heard about it, he divided his men into three groups and set an ambush in the fields. When Abimelech saw the people coming out of the city, he and his men jumped up from their hiding places and attacked them. Abimelech and his group stormed the city gate to keep the men of Shechem from getting back in, while Abimelech's other two groups cut them down in the fields. The battle went on all day before Abimelech finally captured the city. He killed the people, leveled the city, and scattered salt all over the ground. When the leading citizens who lived in the tower of Shechem heard what had happened, they ran and hid in the temple of Balbarith. Someone reported to Abimelech that the citizens had gathered in the temple. So he led his forces to Mount Zalman. He took an axe and chopped some branches from a tree, then put them on his shoulder. Quick, do as I have done, he told his men. So each of them cut down some branches, following Abimelech's example. They piled the branches against the walls of the temple and set them on fire. So all the people who had lived in the tower of Shechem died, about one thousand men and women. 
Then Abimelech attacked the town of Thebes and captured it. But there was a strong tower inside the town, and all the men and women, the entire population, fled to it. They barricaded themselves in and climbed up to the roof of the tower. Abimelech followed them to attack the tower. But as he prepared to set fire to the entrance, a woman on the roof dropped a millstone that landed on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. He quickly said to his young armor-bearer, Draw your sword and kill me. Don't let it be said that a woman killed Abimelech. So the young man ran him through with his sword, and he died. When Abimelech's men saw that he was dead, they disbanded and returned to their homes. In this way, God punished Abimelech for the evil he had done against his father by murdering his seventy brothers. God also punished the men of Shechem for all their evil. So the curse of Jotham son of Gideon was fulfilled. After Abimelech died, Tola son of Pua, son of Dodo, was the next person to rescue Israel. He was from the tribe of Issachar but lived in the town of Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim. He judged Israel for twenty-three years. When he died, he was buried in Shamir. After Tola died, Jair from Gilead judged Israel for twenty-two years. His thirty sons rode around on thirty donkeys, and they owned thirty towns in the land of Gilead, which are still called the towns of Jair. When Jair died, he was buried in Canaan. Again the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. They served the images of Baal and Ashtoreth, and the gods of Aram, Sidon, Moab, Ammon, and Philistia. They abandoned the Lord and no longer served him at all. So the Lord burned with anger against Israel, and he turned them over to the Philistines and the Ammonites, who began to oppress them that year. For eighteen years they oppressed all the Israelites east of the Jordan River in the land of the Amorites, that is, in Gilead. The Ammonites also crossed to the west side of the Jordan and attacked Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim, the Israelites were in great distress. Finally, they cried out to the Lord for help, saying, We have sinned against you because we have abandoned you as our God and have served the images of Baal. The Lord replied, Did I not rescue you from the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Sidonians, the Amalekites, and the Maonites? When they oppressed you, you cried out to me for help, and I rescued you. Yet you have abandoned me and served other gods. So I will not rescue you anymore. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them rescue you in your hour of distress. But the Israelites pleaded with the Lord and said, We have sinned. Punish us as you see fit, only rescue us today from our enemies. Then the Israelites put aside their foreign gods and served the Lord. And he was grieved by their misery. At that time the armies of Ammon had gathered for war and were camped in Gilead, and the people of Israel assembled and camped at Mizpah. The leaders of Gilead said to each other, Whoever attacks the Ammonites first will become ruler over all the people of Gilead. Now Jephthah of Gilead was a great warrior. He was the son of Gilead, but his mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also had several sons, and when these half-brothers grew up, they chased Jephthah off the land. You will not get any of our father's inheritance, they said, for you are the son of a prostitute. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Soon he had a band of worthless rebels following him. At about this time, the Ammonites began their war against Israel. When the Ammonites attacked, the elders of Gilead sent for Jephthah in the land of Tob. The elders said, Come and be our commander. Help us fight the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to them, Aren't you the ones who hated me and drove me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? Because we need you, the elders replied. If you lead us in battle against the Ammonites, we will make you ruler over all the people of Gilead. 
Jephthah said to the elders, Let me get this straight. If I come with you and if the Lord gives me victory over the Ammonites, will you really make me ruler over all the people? The Lord is our witness, the elders replied. We promise to do whatever you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him their ruler and commander of the army. At Mizpah, in the presence of the Lord, Jephthah repeated what he had said to the elders. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of Ammon, asking, Why have you come out to fight against my land? The king of Ammon answered Jephthah's messengers, When the Israelites came out of Egypt, they stole my land from the Arnon River to the Jabbok River and all the way to the Jordan. Now then, give back the land peaceably. Jephthah sent this message back to the Ammonite king. This is what Jephthah says, Israel did not steal any land from Moab or Ammon. When the people of Israel arrived at Kadesh on their journey from Egypt after crossing the Red Sea, they sent messengers to the king of Edom asking for permission to pass through his land. But their request was denied. Then they asked the king of Moab for similar permission, but he wouldn't let them pass through either. So the people of Israel stayed in Kadesh. Finally, they went around Edom and Moab through the wilderness. They traveled along Moab's eastern border and camped on the other side of the Arnon River. But they never once crossed the Arnon River into Moab, for the Arnon was the border of Moab. Then Israel sent messengers to King Sion of the Amorites, who ruled from Heshbon, asking for permission to cross through his land to get to their destination. But King Sion didn't trust Israel to pass through his land. Instead, he mobilized his army at Jahaz and attacked them. But the Lord, the God of Israel, gave his people victory over King Sion. So Israel took control of all the land of the Amorites, who lived in that region. From the Arnon River to the Jabbok River, and from the eastern wilderness to the Jordan. So you see, it was the Lord, the God of Israel, who took away the land from the Amorites and gave it to Israel. Why, then, should we give it back to you? You keep whatever your God Chemosh gives you, and we will keep whatever the Lord our God gives us. Are you any better than Balak son of Zippir, king of Moab? Did he try to make a case against Israel for disputed land? Did he go to war against them? Israel has been living here for 300 years, inhabiting Heshbon and its surrounding settlements, all the way to Aror and its settlements, and in all the towns along the Arnon River. Why have you made no effort to recover it before now? Therefore, I have not sinned against you. Rather, you have wronged me by attacking me. Let the Lord, who is judge, decide today which of us is right, Israel or Ammon. But the king of Ammon paid no attention to Jephthah's message. At that time the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he went throughout the land of Gilead and Manasseh, including Mizpah in Gilead, and from there he led an army against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. He said, If you give me victory over the Ammonites, I will give to the Lord whatever comes out of my house to meet me when I return in triumph. I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. So Jephthah led his army against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave him victory. He crushed the Ammonites, devastating about twenty towns from Aroer to an area near Minith and as far away as Abel Karamim. In this way Israel defeated the Ammonites. When Jephthah returned home to Mizpah, his daughter came out to meet him, playing on a tambourine and dancing for joy. She was his one and only child, he had no other sons or daughters. When he saw her, he tore his clothes in anguish. Oh, my daughter, he cried out. You have completely destroyed me. You've brought disaster on me. 
For I have made a vow to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. And she said, Father, if you have made a vow to the Lord, you must do to me what you have vowed, for the Lord has given you a great victory over your enemies, the Ammonites. But first let me do this one thing, let me go up and roam in the hills and weep with my friends for two months, because I will die a virgin. You may go, Jephthah said. And he sent her away for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never have children. When she returned home, her father kept the vow he had made, and she died a virgin. So it has become a custom in Israel. For young Israelite women to go away for four days each year to lament the fate of Jephthah's daughter. Then the people of Ephraim mobilized an army and crossed over the Jordan River to Zaphon. They sent this message to Jephthah, Why didn't you call for us to help you fight against the Ammonites? We are going to burn down your house with you in it. Jephthah replied, I summoned you at the beginning of the dispute, but you refused to come. You failed to help us in our struggle against Ammon. So when I realized you weren't coming, I risked my life and went to battle without you, and the Lord gave me victory over the Ammonites. So why have you now come to fight me? The people of Ephraim responded, You men of Gilead are nothing more than fugitives from Ephraim and Manasseh. So Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and attacked the men of Ephraim and defeated them. Jephthah captured the shallow crossings of the Jordan River, and whenever a fugitive from Ephraim tried to go back across, the men of Gilead would challenge him. Are you a member of the tribe of Ephraim? they would ask. If the man said, No, I'm not. They would tell him to say, Shibboleth. If he was from Ephraim, he would say, Sibboleth because people from Ephraim cannot pronounce the word correctly. Then they would take him and kill him at the shallow crossings of the Jordan. In all, 42,000 Ephraimites were killed at that time. Jephthah judged Israel for six years. When he died, he was buried in one of the towns of Gilead. After Jephthah died, Ibsen from Bethlehem judged Israel. He had thirty sons and thirty daughters. He sent his daughters to marry men outside his clan, and he brought in thirty young women from outside his clan to marry his sons. Ibsen judged Israel for seven years. When he died, he was buried at Bethlehem. After Ibsen died, Elon from the tribe of Zebulun judged Israel for ten years. When he died, he was buried at Ijalan in Zebulun. After Elon died, Abdon son of Hillel, from Pirathon, judged Israel. He had forty sons and thirty grandsons, who rode on seventy donkeys. He judged Israel for eight years. When he died, he was buried at Pirathon in Ephraim, in the hill country of the Amalekites. Again the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, so the Lord handed them over to the Philistines, who oppressed them for forty years. In those days a man named Manoah from the tribe of Dan lived in the town of Zorah. His wife was unable to become pregnant, and they had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, Even though you have been unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. So be careful, you must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink nor eat any forbidden food. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut. For he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. The woman ran and told her husband, A man of God appeared to me. 
He looked like one of God's angels, terrifying to see. I didn't ask where he was from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he told me, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son. You must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink nor eat any forbidden food. For your son will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from the moment of his birth until the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord, saying, Lord, please let the man of God come back to us again and give us more instructions about this son who is to be born. God answered Manoah's prayer, and the angel of God appeared once again to his wife as she was sitting in the field. But her husband, Manoah, was not with her. So she quickly ran and told her husband, The man who appeared to me the other day is here again. Manoah ran back with his wife and asked, Are you the man who spoke to my wife the other day? Yes, he replied, I am. So Manoah asked him, When your words come true, what kind of rules should govern the boy's life and work? The angel of the Lord replied, be sure your wife follows the instructions I gave her. She must not eat grapes or raisins, drink wine or any other alcoholic drink, or eat any forbidden food. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please stay here until we can prepare a young goat for you to eat. I will stay, the angel of the Lord replied, but I will not eat anything. However, you may prepare a burnt offering as a sacrifice to the Lord. Manoah didn't realize it was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah asked the angel of the Lord, What is your name? For when all this comes true, we want to honor you. Why do you ask my name? The angel of the Lord replied. It is too wonderful for you to understand. Then Manoah took a young goat and a grain offering and offered it on a rock as a sacrifice to the Lord. And as Manoah and his wife watched, the Lord did an amazing thing. As the flames from the altar shot up toward the sky, the angel of the Lord ascended in the fire. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell with their faces to the ground. The angel did not appear again to Manoah and his wife. Manoah finally realized it was the angel of the Lord. And he said to his wife, We will certainly die, for we have seen God. But his wife said, If the Lord were going to kill us, he wouldn't have accepted our burnt offering and grain offering. He wouldn't have appeared to us and told us this wonderful thing and done these miracles. When her son was born, she named him Samson. And the Lord blessed him as he grew up. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he lived in Mahanadan, which is located between the towns of Zorah and Eshtael. One day when Samson was in Timnah, one of the Philistine women caught his eye. When he returned home, he told his father and mother, A young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye. I want to marry her. Get her for me. His father and mother objected. Isn't there even one woman in our tribe or among all the Israelites you could marry? They asked. Why must you go to the pagan Philistines to find a wife? But Samson told his father, Get her for me. She looks good to me. His father and mother didn't realize the Lord was at work in this, creating an opportunity to work against the Philistines, who ruled over Israel at that time. As Samson and his parents were going down to Timnah, a young lion suddenly attacked Samson near the vineyards of Timnah. At that moment the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him, and he ripped the lion's jaws apart with his bare hands. He did it as easily as if it were a young goat. But he didn't tell his father or mother about it. When Samson arrived in Timnah, he talked with the woman and was very pleased with her. Later, when he returned to Timnah for the wedding, he turned off the path to look at the carcass of the lion. And he found that a swarm of bees had made some honey in the carcass. 
He scooped some of the honey into his hands and ate it along the way. He also gave some to his father and mother, and they ate it. But he didn't tell them he had taken the honey from the carcass of the lion. As his father was making final arrangements for the marriage, Samson threw a party at Timnah, as was the custom for elite young men. When the bride's parents saw him, they selected thirty young men from the town to be his companions. Samson said to them, Let me tell you a riddle. If you solve my riddle during these seven days of the celebration, I will give you thirty fine linen robes and thirty sets of festive clothing. But if you can't solve it, then you must give me thirty fine linen robes and thirty sets of festive clothing. All right, they agreed, let's hear your riddle. So he said, Out of the one who eats came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. Three days later they were still trying to figure it out. On the fourth day they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband to explain the riddle for us, or we will burn down your father's house with you in it. Did you invite us to this party just to make us poor? So Samson's wife came to him in tears and said, You don't love me, you hate me. You have given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. I haven't even given the answer to my father or mother, he replied. Why should I tell you? So she cried whenever she was with him and kept it up for the rest of the celebration. At last, on the seventh day he told her the answer because she was tormenting him with her nagging. Then she explained the riddle to the young men. So before sunset of the seventh day, the men of the town came to Samson with their answer, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson replied, If you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have solved my riddle. Then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to the town of Ashkelon, killed thirty men, took their belongings, and gave their clothing to the men who had solved his riddle. But Samson was furious about what had happened, and he went back home to live with his father and mother. So his wife was given in marriage to the man who had been Samson's best man at the wedding. Later on, during the wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat as a present to his wife. He said, I'm going into my wife's room to sleep with her, but her father wouldn't let him in. I truly thought you must hate her, her father explained, so I gave her in marriage to your best man. But look, her younger sister is even more beautiful than she is. Marry her instead. Samson said, this time I cannot be blamed for everything I am going to do to you Philistines. Then he went out and caught three hundred foxes. He tied their tails together in pairs, and he fastened a torch to each pair of tails. Then he lit the torches and let the foxes run through the grain fields of the Philistines. He burned all their grain to the ground, including the sheaves and the uncut grain. He also destroyed their vineyards and olive groves. Who did this, the Philistines demanded, Samson, was the reply, because his father-in-law from Timnah gave Samson's wife to be married to his best man. So the Philistines went and got the woman and her father and burned them to death. Because you did this, Samson vowed, I won't rest until I take my revenge on you. So he attacked the Philistines with great fury and killed many of them. Then he went to live in a cave in the rock of Etam. The Philistines retaliated by setting up camp in Judah and spreading out near the town of Lehi. The men of Judah asked the Philistines, Why are you attacking us? The Philistines replied, We've come to capture Samson. We've come to pay him back for what he did to us. So three thousand men of Judah went down to get Samson at the cave in the rock of Etam. They said to Samson, Don't you realize the Philistines rule over us? What are you doing to us? But Samson replied, I only did to them what they did to me. 
But the men of Judah told him, We have come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. All right, Samson said. But promise that you won't kill me yourselves. We will only tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines, they replied. We won't kill you. So they tied him up with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. As Samson arrived at Lehi, the Philistines came shouting in triumph. But the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson, and he snapped the ropes on his arms as if they were burnt strands of flax, and they fell from his wrists. Then he found the jawbone of a recently killed donkey. He picked it up and killed one thousand Philistines with it. Then Samson said, With the jawbone of a donkey. I've piled them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey. I've killed a thousand men. When he finished his boasting, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was named Jawbone Hill. Samson was now very thirsty, and he cried out to the Lord, You have accomplished this great victory by the strength of your servant. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of these pagans? So God caused water to gush out of a hollow in the ground at Lehi, and Samson was revived as he drank. Then he named that place, the spring of the one who cried out, and it is still in Lehi to this day. Samson judged Israel for twenty years during the period when the Philistines dominated the land. One day Samson went to the Philistine town of Gaza and spent the night with a prostitute. Word soon spread that Samson was there, so the men of Gaza gathered together and waited all night at the town gates. They kept quiet during the night, saying to themselves, When the light of morning comes, we will kill him. But Samson stayed in bed only until midnight. Then he got up, took hold of the doors of the town gate, including the two posts, and lifted them up, bar and all. He put them on his shoulders and carried them all the way to the top of the hill across from Hebron. Some time later Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah, who lived in the valley of Sorek. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, Entice Samson to tell you what makes him so strong and how he can be overpowered and tied up securely. Then each of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me what makes you so strong and what it would take to tie you up securely. Samson replied, If I were tied up with seven new bowstrings that have not yet been dried, I would become as weak as anyone else. So the Philistine rulers brought Delilah seven new bowstrings, and she tied Samson up with them. She had hidden some men in one of the inner rooms of her house, and she cried out, Samson. The Philistines have come to capture you. But Samson snapped the bowstrings as a piece of string snaps when it is burned by a fire. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Afterward Delilah said to him, You've been making fun of me and telling me lies. Now please tell me how you can be tied up securely. Samson replied, if I were tied up with brand new ropes that had never been used, I would become as weak as anyone else. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him up with them. The men were hiding in the inner room as before, and again Delilah cried out, Samson. The Philistines have come to capture you. But again Samson snapped the ropes from his arms as if they were thread. Then Delilah said, You've been making fun of me and telling me lies. Now tell me how you can be tied up securely. Samson replied, If you were to weave the seven braids of my hair into the fabric on your loom and tighten it with the loom shuttle, I would become as weak as anyone else. So while he slept, Delilah wove the seven braids of his hair into the fabric. Then she tightened it with the loom shuttle, again she cried out, Samson. The Philistines have come to capture you. But Samson woke up, pulled back the loom shuttle, 
and yanked his hair away from the loom and the fabric. Then Delilah pouted, How can you tell me, I love you, when you don't share your secrets with me? You've made fun of me three times now, and you still haven't told me what makes you so strong. She tormented him with her nagging day after day until he was sick to death of it. Finally, Samson shared his secret with her. My hair has never been cut, he confessed, for I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as anyone else. Delilah realized he had finally told her the truth, so she sent for the Philistine rulers. Come back one more time, she said, for he has finally told me his secret. So the Philistine rulers returned with the money in their hands. Delilah lulled Samson to sleep with his head in her lap, and then she called in a man to shave off the seven locks of his hair. In this way she began to bring him down, and his strength left him. Then she cried out, Samson! The Philistines have come to capture you. When he woke up, he thought, I will do as before and shake myself free. But he didn't realize the Lord had left him. So the Philistines captured him and gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza, where he was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. But before long, his hair began to grow back. The Philistine rulers held a great festival, offering sacrifices and praising their god, Dagon. They said, Our God has given us victory over our enemy Samson. When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy to us. The one who killed so many of us is now in our power. Half drunk by now, the people demanded, Bring out Samson so he can amuse us. So he was brought from the prison to amuse them and they had him stand between the pillars supporting the roof. Samson said to the young servant who was leading him by the hand, Place my hands against the pillars that hold up the temple. I want to rest against them. Now the temple was completely filled with people. All the Philistine rulers were there, and there were about three thousand men and women on the roof who were watching as Samson amused them. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me again. O oh God, please strengthen me just one more time. With one blow let me pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. Then Samson put his hands on the two center pillars that held up the temple. Pushing against them with both hands. He prayed, Let me die with the Philistines. And the temple crashed down on the Philistine rulers and all the people. So he killed more people when he died than he had during his entire lifetime. Later his brothers and other relatives went down to get his body. They took him back home and buried him between Zorah and Eshtael, where his father, Manoah, was buried. Samson had judged Israel for twenty years. There was a man named Micah, who lived in the hill country of Ephraim. One day he said to his mother, I heard you place a curse on the person who stole 1,100 pieces of silver from you. Well, I have the money. I was the one who took it. The Lord bless you for admitting it, his mother replied. He returned the money to her, and she said, I now dedicate these silver coins to the Lord. In honor of my son, I will have an image carved and an idol cast. So when he returned the money to his mother, she took two hundred silver coins and gave them to a silversmith, who made them into an image and an idol. And these were placed in Micah's house. Micah set up a shrine for the idol, and he made a sacred ephod and some household idols. Then he installed one of his sons as his personal priest. In those days Israel had no king, all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. One day a young Levite, 
who had been living in Bethlehem in Judah, arrived in that area. He had left Bethlehem in search of another place to live, and as he traveled, he came to the hill country of Ephraim. He happened to stop at Micah's house as he was traveling through. Where are you from? Micah asked him that he replied, I am a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I am looking for a place to live. Stay here with me, Micah said, and you can be a father and priest to me. I will give you ten pieces of silver a year, plus a change of clothes and your food. The Levite agreed to this, and the young man became like one of Micah's sons. So Micah installed the Levite as his personal priest, and he lived in Micah's house. I know the Lord will bless me now, Micah said, because I have a Levite serving as my priest. Now in those days Israel had no king. And the tribe of Dan was trying to find a place where they could settle, for they had not yet moved into the land assigned to them when the land was divided among the tribes of Israel. So the men of Dan chose from their clans five capable warriors from the towns of Zorah and Eshtael to scout out a land for them to settle in. When these warriors arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, they came to Micah's house and spent the night there. While at Micah's house, they recognized the young Levite's accent, so they went over and asked him, Who brought you here, and what are you doing in this place? Why are you here? He told them about his agreement with Micah and that he had been hired as Micah's personal priest. Then they said, Ask God whether or not our journey will be successful. Go in peace, the priest replied. For the Lord is watching over your journey. So the five men went on to the town of Lish, where they noticed the people living carefree lives, like the Sidonians, they were peaceful and secure. The people were also wealthy because their land was very fertile. And they lived a great distance from Sidon and had no allies nearby. When the men returned to Zorah and Eshtael, their relatives asked them, What did you find? The men replied, Come on, let's attack them. We have seen the land, and it is very good. What are you waiting for? Don't hesitate to go and take possession of it. When you get there, you will find the people living carefree lives. God has given us a spacious and fertile land, lacking in nothing. So six hundred men from the tribe of Dan, armed with weapons of war, set out from Zorah and Eshtael. They camped at a place west of Kiriat Jerim in Judah, which is called Mahanadan to this day. Then they went on from there into the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. The five men who had scouted out the land around Lish explained to the others, These buildings contain a sacred ephod, as well as some household idols, a carved image, and a cast idol. What do you think you should do? Then the five men turned off the road and went over to Micah's house, where the young Levite lived, and greeted him kindly. As the six hundred armed warriors from the tribe of Dan stood at the entrance of the gate, the five scouts entered the shrine and removed the carved image, the sacred ephod, the household idols, and the cast idol. Meanwhile, the priest was standing at the gate with the six hundred armed warriors. When the priest saw the men carrying all the sacred objects out of Micah's shrine, he said, What are you doing? Be quiet and come with us, they said. Be a father and priest to all of us. Isn't it better to be a priest for an entire tribe and clan of Israel than for the household of just one man? The young priest was quite happy to go with them, so he took along the sacred ephod, the household idols, and the carved image. They turned and started on their way again, placing their children, livestock, and possessions in front of them. When the people from the tribe of Dan were quite a distance from Micah's house, the people who lived near Micah came chasing after them. They were shouting as they caught up with them. The men of Dan turned around and said to Micah, What's the matter? Why have you called these men together and chased after us like this? 
What do you mean, what's the matter? Micah replied. You've taken away all the gods I have made, and my priest, and I have nothing left. The men of Dan said, Watch what you say. There are some short-tempered men around here who might get angry and kill you and your family. So the men of Dan continued on their way. When Micah saw that there were too many of them for him to attack, he turned around and went home. Then, with Micah's idols and his priest, the men of Dan came to the town of Lish, whose people were peaceful and secure. They attacked with swords and burned the town to the ground. There was no one to rescue the people, for they lived a great distance from Sidon and had no allies nearby. This happened in the valley near Beth Rehob, then the people of the tribe of Dan rebuilt the town and lived there. They renamed the town Dan after their ancestor, Israel's son, but it had originally been called Lish. Then they set up the carved image, and they appointed Jonathan son of Gershom, son of Moses, as their priest. This family continued as priests for the tribe of Dan until the exile. So Micah's carved image was worshipped by the tribe of Dan as long as the tabernacle of God remained at Shiloh. Now in those days Israel had no king. There was a man from the tribe of Levi living in a remote area of the hill country of Ephraim. One day he brought home a woman from Bethlehem in Judah to be his concubine. But she became angry with him and returned to her father's home in Bethlehem after about four months. Her husband set out for Bethlehem to speak personally to her and persuade her to come back. He took with him a servant and a pair of donkeys. When he arrived at her father's house, her father saw him and welcomed him. Her father urged him to stay a while, so he stayed three days, eating, drinking, and sleeping there. On the fourth day the man was up early, ready to leave, but the woman's father said to his son-in-law, Have something to eat before you go. So the two men sat down together and had something to eat and drink. Then the woman's father said, Please stay another night and enjoy yourself. The man got up to leave, but his father-in-law kept urging him to stay, so he finally gave in and stayed the night. On the morning of the fifth day he was up early again, ready to leave, and again the woman's father said, Have something to eat, then you can leave later this afternoon. So they had another day of feasting. Later, as the man and his concubine and servant were preparing to leave, his father-in-law said, Look, it's almost evening. Stay the night and enjoy yourself. Tomorrow you can get up early and be on your way. But this time the man was determined to leave. So he took his two saddled donkeys and his concubine and headed in the direction of Jebus, that is, Jerusalem. It was late in the day when they neared Jebus, and the man's servant said to him, Let's stop at this Jebusite town and spend the night there. No, his master said, we can't stay in this foreign town where there are no Israelites. Instead, we will go on to Gibeah. Come on, let's try to get as far as Gibeah or Ramah, and we'll spend the night in one of those towns. So they went on. The sun was setting as they came to Gibeah, a town in the land of Benjamin. So they stopped there to spend the night. They rested in the town square, but no one took them in for the night. That evening an old man came home from his work in the fields. He was from the hill country of Ephraim, but he was living in Gibeah, where the people were from the tribe of Benjamin. When he saw the travelers sitting in the town square, he asked them where they were from and where they were going. We have been in Bethlehem in Judah, the man replied. We are on our way to a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim, which is my home. I traveled to Bethlehem, and now I'm returning home. But no one has taken us in for the night. Even though we have everything we need. 
We have straw and feed for our donkeys and plenty of bread and wine for ourselves. You are welcome to stay with me, the old man said. I will give you anything you might need. But whatever you do, don't spend the night in the square. So he took them home with him and fed the donkeys. After they washed their feet, they ate and drank together. While they were enjoying themselves, a crowd of troublemakers from the town surrounded the house. They began beating at the door and shouting to the old man, Bring out the man who is staying with you so we can have sex with him. The old man stepped outside to talk to them. No, my brothers, don't do such an evil thing. For this man is a guest in my house, and such a thing would be shameful. Here, take my virgin daughter and this man's concubine. I will bring them out to you, and you can abuse them and do whatever you like. But don't do such a shameful thing to this man. But they wouldn't listen to him. So the Levite took hold of his concubine and pushed her out the door. The men of the town abused her all night, taking turns raping her until morning. Finally, at dawn they let her go. At daybreak the woman returned to the house where her husband was staying. She collapsed at the door of the house and lay there until it was light. When her husband opened the door to leave, there lay his concubine with her hands on the threshold. He said, Get up. Let's go. But there was no answer. So he put her body on his donkey and took her home. When he got home, he took a knife and cut his concubine's body into twelve pieces. Then he sent one piece to each tribe throughout all the territory of Israel. Everyone who saw it said, Such a horrible crime has not been committed in all the time since Israel left Egypt. Think about it. What are we going to do? Who's going to speak up? Then all the Israelites were united as one man, from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, including those from across the Jordan in the land of Gilead. The entire community assembled in the presence of the Lord at Mizpah. The leaders of all the people and all the tribes of Israel, 400,000 warriors armed with swords, took their positions in the assembly of the people of God. Word soon reached the land of Benjamin that the other tribes had gone up to Mizpah. The Israelites then asked how this terrible crime had happened. The Levite, the husband of the woman who had been murdered, said, My concubine and I came to spend the night in Gibeah, a town that belongs to the people of Benjamin. That night some of the leading citizens of Gibeah surrounded the house, planning to kill me, and they raped my concubine until she was dead. So I cut her body into twelve pieces and sent the pieces throughout the territory assigned to Israel, for these men have committed a terrible and shameful crime. Now then, all of you, the entire community of Israel, must decide here and now what should be done about this. And all the people rose to their feet in unison and declared, None of us will return home. No, not even one of us. Instead, this is what we will do to Gibeah, we will draw lots to decide who will attack it. One-tenth of the men from each tribe will be chosen to supply the warriors with food, and the rest of us will take revenge on Gibeah of Benjamin for this shameful thing they have done in Israel. So all the Israelites were completely united, and they gathered together to attack the town. The Israelites sent messengers to the tribe of Benjamin, saying, what a terrible thing has been done among you. Give up those evil men, those troublemakers from Gibeah, so we can execute them and purge Israel of this evil. But the people of Benjamin would not listen. Instead, they came from their towns and gathered at Gibeah to fight the Israelites. In all, 26,000 of their warriors armed with swords arrived in Gibeah to join the 700 elite troops who lived there. Among Benjamin's elite troops, 700 were left-handed, and each of them could sling a rock and hit a target within a hair's breadth without missing. Israel had 400,000 experienced soldiers armed with swords, not counting Benjamin's warriors. 
Before the battle the Israelites went to Bethel and asked God, which tribe should go first to attack the people of Benjamin? The Lord answered, Judah is to go first. So the Israelites left early the next morning and camped near Gibeah. Then they advanced toward Gibeah to attack the men of Benjamin. But Benjamin's warriors, who were defending the town, came out and killed 22,000 Israelites on the battlefield that day. But the Israelites encouraged each other and took their positions again at the same place they had fought the previous day. For they had gone up to Bethel and wept in the presence of the Lord until evening. They had asked the Lord, Should we fight against our relatives from Benjamin again? And the Lord had said, Go out and fight against them. So the next day they went out again to fight against the men of Benjamin. But the men of Benjamin killed another 18,000 Israelites, all of whom were experienced with the sword. Then all the Israelites went up to Bethel and wept in the presence of the Lord and fasted until evening. They also brought burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. The Israelites went up seeking direction from the Lord. In those days the Ark of the Covenant of God was in Bethel. And Phinehas son of Eleazar and grandson of Aaron was the priest. The Israelites asked the Lord, Should we fight against our relatives from Benjamin again, or should we stop? The Lord said, Go. Tomorrow I will hand them over to you. So the Israelites set an ambush all around Gibeah. They went out on the third day and took their positions at the same place as before. When the men of Benjamin came out to attack, they were drawn away from the town. And as they had done before, they began to kill the Israelites. About thirty Israelites died in the open fields and along the roads, one leading to Bethel and the other leading back to Gibeah. Then the warriors of Benjamin shouted, We're defeating them as we did before. But the Israelites had planned in advance to run away so that the men of Benjamin would chase them along the roads and be drawn away from the town. When the main group of Israelite warriors reached Baltamar, they turned and took up their positions. Meanwhile, the Israelites hiding in ambush to the west of Gibeah jumped up to fight. There were 10,000 elite Israelite troops who advanced against Gibeah. The fighting was so heavy that Benjamin didn't realize the impending disaster. So the Lord helped Israel defeat Benjamin, and that day the Israelites killed 25,100 of Benjamin's warriors, all of whom were experienced swordsmen. Then the men of Benjamin saw that they were beaten, the Israelites had retreated from Benjamin's warriors in order to give those hiding in ambush more room to maneuver against Gibeah. Then those who were hiding rushed in from all sides and killed everyone in the town. They had arranged to send up a large cloud of smoke from the town as a signal. When the Israelites saw the smoke, they turned and attacked Benjamin's warriors. By that time Benjamin's warriors had killed about 30 Israelites, and they shouted, We're defeating them as we did in the first battle. But when the warriors of Benjamin looked behind them and saw the smoke rising into the sky from every part of the town, the men of Israel turned and attacked. At this point the men of Benjamin became terrified, because they realized disaster was close at hand. So they turned around and fled before the Israelites toward the wilderness. But they couldn't escape the battle, and the people who came out of the nearby towns were also killed. The Israelites surrounded the men of Benjamin and chased them relentlessly, finally overtaking them east of Gibeah. That day 18,000 of Benjamin's strongest warriors died in battle. The survivors fled into the wilderness toward the Rock of Rimmon, but Israel killed 5,000 of them along the road. They continued the chase until they had killed another 2,000 near Jittim. So that day the tribe of Benjamin lost 25,000 strong warriors armed with swords. Leaving only 600 men who escaped to the Rock of Rimmon, where they lived for four months. And the Israelites returned and slaughtered every living thing in all the towns, the people, the livestock, and everything they found. They also burned down all the towns they came to. The Israelites had vowed at Mizpah, we will never give our daughters in marriage to a man from the tribe of Benjamin. Now the people went to Bethel and sat in the presence of God until evening, 
weeping loudly and bitterly. O Lord, God of Israel, they cried out, Why has this happened in Israel? Now one of our tribes is missing from Israel. Early the next morning the people built an altar and presented their burnt offerings and peace offerings on it. Then they said, who among the tribes of Israel did not join us at Mizpah when we held our assembly in the presence of the Lord. At that time they had taken a solemn oath in the Lord's presence, vowing that anyone who refused to come would be put to death. The Israelites felt sorry for their brother Benjamin and said, Today one of the tribes of Israel has been cut off. How can we find wives for the few who remain? since we have sworn by the Lord not to give them our daughters in marriage. So they asked, Who among the tribes of Israel did not join us at Mizpah when we assembled in the presence of the Lord? And they discovered that no one from Jabesh Gilead had attended the assembly. For after they counted all the people, no one from Jabesh Gilead was present. So the assembly sent twelve thousand of their best warriors to Jabesh Gilead with orders to kill everyone there, including women and children. This is what you are to do, they said. Completely destroy all the males and every woman who is not a virgin. Among the residents of Jabesh Gilead they found four hundred young virgins who had never slept with a man, and they brought them to the camp at Shiloh in the land of Canaan. The Israelite assembly sent a peace delegation to the remaining people of Benjamin who were living at the Rock of Rimmon. Then the men of Benjamin returned to their homes, and the four hundred women of Jabesh Gilead who had been spared were given to them as wives. But there were not enough women for all of them. The people felt sorry for Benjamin because the Lord had made this gap among the tribes of Israel. So the elders of the assembly asked, how can we find wives for the few who remain, since the women of the tribe of Benjamin are dead? There must be heirs for the survivors so that an entire tribe of Israel is not wiped out. But we cannot give them our own daughters in marriage because we have sworn with a solemn oath that anyone who does this will fall under God's curse. Then they thought of the annual festival of the Lord held in Shiloh, south of Lebanon and north of Bethel, along the east side of the road that goes from Bethel to Shechem. They told the men of Benjamin who still needed wives, go and hide in the vineyards. When you see the young women of Shiloh come out for their dances, rush out from the vineyards, and each of you can take one of them home to the land of Benjamin to be your wife. And when their fathers and brothers come to us in protest, we will tell them, please be sympathetic. Let them have your daughters, for we didn't find wives for all of them when we destroyed Jabesh Gilead. And you are not guilty of breaking the vow since you did not actually give your daughters to them in marriage. So the men of Benjamin did as they were told. Each man caught one of the women as she danced in the celebration and carried her off to be his wife. They returned to their own land, and they rebuilt their towns and lived in them. Then the people of Israel departed by tribes and families, and they returned to their own homes. In those days Israel had no king, all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes.